I'll be presenting today on the topic uh, more from the perspective of the port operator. So one good thing is that Captain Subra already laid the foundation earlier from his presentation in regards to uh, the initiatives put in by the government and also specifically Port Klang Authority for the importers and exporters uh, in the West Malaysia, uh, which has helped the port uh, to continue uh, being resilient in the last many years in terms of the growth. So uh, my presentation, I will touch on the on our growth, West Port's growth, uh, very quickly on the implications of COVID and the commercial impact of the COVID as well. Then I'll go into a few uh, examples of what we have done in the past, which helped us to manage uh, the crisis and the expectation well, and what we're going to continue doing so that uh, we are ready in future to manage uh, expectation, manage growth, or many crises that uh, might come our way. Uh, I'm not basically, uh, or we are not basically uh, looking forward to crisis, but based on the experience that we have had in the last 25 years of the port, uh, we have seen many crises. Uh, that's why it may, basically makes us pretty much uh, ready to face any crisis moving forward. So uh, quickly touching about Westport as well, from the time we started 1994, the container started in 96. Uh, we were basically born right uh, in midst or right before major crisis uh, that, that the whole world faced. But throughout the years where we uh, increased our container volume from 96 uh, up to now, we have seen uh, many crises, starting from the 98 crisis, just when the port started, uh, when all the interest rates basically went up over here in Malaysia. Then uh, the SARS, and the first time we saw a volume dipping, 2008 global financial crisis. But then immediately in the next year, we came back pretty much uh, growing pretty big. Then uh, the last uh, crisis we uh, in Port Clay actually faced was 2016 uh, when, the, when one of the shipping lines went bust. But basically, uh, that was the year where there was one of the biggest mergers and acquisition among shipping lines in the world, which saw some shipping lines moving their hub uh, from one place to another place. So we had one decline. But we have faced all these uh, crises uh, by being positive, doing the right thing. And as what Captain Subra updated earlier, last year was one of our best years. Uh, Port Klang handles 13.5. Westport alone contributed around 80% of that volume, close to 11 million TUs, uh, promoting, uh, propelling Port Klang to be at least the 12th largest port in the world. So uh, just to put in perspective, a lot of these crises have taught us that uh, the future would not be a smooth sailing. So we have actually tried our best to be ready to mitigate whatever coming forward by making sure that uh, we do the right thing as early as possible. So quickly talking about the implication of the COVID as well. Uh, blank sailings was one of the bigger things uh, that impacted the ports. Uh, we had a massive reduction in terms of sailings uh, due to low, lower demand. But one good thing about Port Klang, or at least the importers, exporters of Malaysia, the shipping lines continued coming to our port. Uh, mainly also because the government had a policy while there was uh, MCO movement control orders being introduced, the ports deemed as the essential service were allowed to operate 24 hours without any uh, restriction. Uh, that helped us uh, to keep the supply chain flowing. The ports, we basically, although the volume reduced, but at least because the port was open and also due to the fact that instead of just catering for the Malaysian import export, we were also one of the bigger hubs in this region catering for the region. So the shipping lines continued coming over here. That basically helped our own import export to keep flowing, the essential goods to come in and all that. So that was one good thing. Although on top of the blank sailings, we continued to have shipping lines coming over here as well. Uh, increased unemployment worldwide, but in terms of us, Westport, we have always determined not to retrench. We take it as an opportunity to train our guys. So during this period as well, although we had quite a number of uh, additional staffs, especially after reaching the high of last year. So we were determined to train them. So that was something that we continued doing. And all the other challenges which uh, was faced by the industry, like consumption, Captain Sobra basically uh, touched on this pretty much. But at least one of the good things that over here, the government did, especially through Park Klang Authority, is that we kept the channel open 
with all the port users, all the key uh, parties who kept the supply chain operating during, even during the movement control order and after that when the restrictions were lifted slightly. We continued operating mainly because there were very open uh, communication with all the parties to make sure that uh, we allow the cargo to move, cargo to reach wherever you need to, because uh, the port is pretty much essential to everything else uh, which happens in the country. So we have to make sure that that channel is, uh, that continue to open. But also touching on our role as the, one of the regional hubs, we also catered for the issues faced in the other ports. Especially during the first quarter when China went into early lockdown, we had quite a number of Chinese cargo uh, being stored over here mainly because we had the capacity. And later on, when India also went into lockdown, maybe up to now, we also had uh, cargoes being staged over here as well. Then uh, reefers, which was going to China, Philippines, during their lockdowns, they needed a port to keep it. So we offered that uh, opportunity as well to our shipping lines to allow these reefers, not meant for our countries, but because we had the capacity to cater for it. So ideally, uh, as a key hub port in this region, uh, we had the opportunity not only to make sure that the uh, supply chain channel for the country remained open, but we also catered for some of the challenges faced uh, in the other markets. We uh, supported the shipping lines which we were using as our hub to keep the cargoes over here. So that was one of the things that uh, we managed to do during this period. Quickly touching on the commercial impact, uh, for the first, one, first quarter, on a weekly basis, uh, we were averaging as what we did last, last year. We were averaging about 200,000 TUs a week. Uh, but when March, end of March came, uh, then April, May, uh, very clearly we saw the volume going down. Uh, first was holding, then it went down double digit as well. Towards uh, end of May, we saw the volume continue to decline at least up to middle of May. But since then, we have seen slight recovery, but not nowhere close to what it was before the COVID-19 uh, related lockdowns and MCO came into place. As what Captain Subra updated earlier, we believe this uh, recovery slightly is because trying to catch up on some of the uh, lost movements of orders during the MCO period. So we don't know how things will, uh, will, uh, get, will end up for the rest of the year or coming one to two years. But we are just hopeful that with all the things that we have in place, we can mitigate whatever challenges uh, that will be coming our way as well. So this is just showing uh, how the impact has been since the lockdown started in Malaysia, especially towards the end of March. So uh, touching on what helped us to mitigate uh, these challenges pretty quickly, what are the foundations uh, that we had in place to allow us to manage this crisis during this time is, uh, we had ample port capacity, as of uh, end of last year, we had about like 14 million TUs capacity. Like I updated earlier, we only handled close to about 11 million TUs last year. So we had at least 46,000 ground slots with ability to store up to 150,000 TUs at any one time. So during the COVID period, uh, although there were some uh, slowdowns in terms of the clients being able to take out their containers from the port, uh, and the government, to be fair, facilitated even non-essential cargo during port phases to be taken out from the port, we were able to store the containers for a longer period compared to normal because we had the capacity. And while we had the sample capacity, we also continued building, uh, although the construction stopped, we even had planned before the MCO to continue building uh, additional 4,000 ground slots. So that is ready by fourth quarter this year. So the additional capacity we had in place Although in terms of waterfront volume, the volume actually went down. But in terms of yard space, we had a capacity in place to help our own importers and exporters. Uh, exporters who send in the containers, but because of blank sailings, container had to sit in yards longer than usual. Importers, because of the challenges in the market, warehouse, MCOs and all that, we were able to cater to our own importers and exporters on top of the other markets that we were serving. Even reefers, like I updated earlier, we have close to 3,000 uh, reefer slots. We were able to cater for our own uh, essential goods, but also we were, even in the first quarter, planning to put additional reefer slots as well, mainly trying to cater for the increased number of perishable goods now applying the market. So all this helped us to manage uh, the expectation or the challenges uh, which came with the MCO or the COVID-19. 
So in a way that uh, all this, although we were basically putting all this to be able to cater for future growth uh, being supply driven, but during the crisis, all this additional capacity actually helped us uh, to manage the challenges, a different type of challenges where containers were finding it, uh, were basically staying in our port longer than expected. So in terms of shipping lines, uh, during the lockdown CMCO periods, uh, a lot of empty containers because of lo loss of demand or drop in demand from exporters or in other markets. One of the things that uh, we have done, uh, we have embarked in the last many years inside the port is to offer land to shipping lines to have their own on-dock depot. So these depot basically is, uh, are used to keep empty containers to clean so that it can be delivered directly to exporters. So during this period, all these on-dock depots uh, basically catered for shipping lines to discharge more empties in our port to clean it, keep it, so that when the upturn comes, they can deliver it direct from our port. So, so when end of May, early June came, one of the things we saw was the export demand picked up quickly uh, in our local market. So this initiative actually helped uh, the local exporters as well, whereby the shipping lines had empties ready over here to be able to be delivered to our clients because they, we had the facility inside the port uh, to store, to clean, to repair these empties, uh, which, which has already been there for the last few years as well. And all these depots also allowed the shipping lines as well uh, to keep the empties, clean it, and distribute, distribute it to other markets uh, when, the, when those lockdowns were eased in a way. So this basically uh, allowed us to be resilient in terms of our own volume whereby as Captain Sobra updated earlier, 65% uh, of our volume is transshipment, 35% is uh, local. Uh, because of the transshipment volume that we cater for, we get a lot more direct services coming to our port, which helps our importers and exporters. So this on dock depots as well, uh, managed to cater for our own uh, slight rebound, which came towards uh, June or July. The empties were available over here. And when these Chinese lockdowns were lifted towards the end of first quarter, the empties were being able to repatriate back to, the, to those markets from here. So this in a way helped our clients, the shipping lines, uh, to be able to use our port for services which they could do uh, while the demand was going down to keep the empties and all that. For our own importers and exporters as well, one of the things that we have embarked on uh, very uh, passionately in the last many years was to automate our services so that uh, people don't have to come to the port uh, to do business. So while the new world was social distancing, uh, we felt some years back that we have to distance people physically from coming to the port so that they can do business through online. So this is more for our local importers, exporters. We introduced a lot of uh, modules through our e-portal. So when the, actually the crisis came towards the first quarter, about 98% of transactions all our importers and exporters were doing with us was through e-services. So a haulier basically comes to our gate and just touches his port pass uh, on the radar and we would know what container he came to pick up without any physical documents. So in a way, we also didn't have to have any physical uh, engagement with the driver as well. So all this basically helped us to manage uh, the expectation during the COVID-19 well because most of our services were already on e-services or people basically can go online to make requests or to know uh, the status of their container, or even uh, to generate gate pass without coming to the port. So even late last year, we also relaunched our mobile app for key functions or key uh, modules for clients to be able to access it from their smartphone as well without having to go to their workstations, laptops, or even the desktops as well. So all these services that we are introducing, uh, or introduced are working well at the moment. It's free of charge. Uh, and there's no additional charge on top of whatever port charges that we are collecting as of now. So this is something which allowed us uh, to manage the uh, expectation during the COVID-19 whereby social distancing, people are not allowed to travel. So we didn't have to have people to come to the port to do clearance of their cargo uh, rising with us. So this helped us pretty well. So with all this foundation, uh, which we, we put in place, which helped us to manage the challenges. So forging ahead, some of the things that uh, we want to continue driving, continue doing, uh, is uh, focusing on automation and also digitalization. So as I updated earlier, our customer portal allowed us to have at least close to 98% uh, engagement with clients through e-services. 
we want to take it as close to 100% by year end. So we have already started engaging our shipping lines, forwarders, importers, exporters as well uh, on an improved customer portal, which we're going to call uh, ETP, uh, uh, ETP 3.0, uh, E-Terminal Plus, uh, which is what we call it, which we hope to start launching the new modules by module uh, approach from next month to be completed by middle of this uh, middle of next year. So in this uh, in this environment, we're gonna make sure that we are more connected to shipping lines, all years, CFS, government agencies, and all other stakeholders. And also we're gonna be planning to introduce new modules as well to simplify uh, the way that clients do business with us. In terms of future automations and all that as well, we are pretty much focused on a lot of initiatives that are trying to drive uh, GPS uh, instead of just using it for holidays coming into the port, even for our own equipment, uh, new systems for conventional as well, cargo handling called ITAP, uh, as what the port authority shared earlier, green technology, we're gonna find ways how we can tap on new green technology, optical container recognition. So we're gonna embark on all this moving forward as well. Uh, to make sure that whatever that we do today will also make us resilient in terms of whatever new challenges that might come uh, in the coming years. One of the things that we have is we have uh, adequate workforce in the country as well. Uh, as the country pushes towards a high income country, we are trying to also change quite a number of jobs we have uh, on ground here as well to high, uh, more towards uh, high income jobs as well. So the real time pay check is one of the things that we introduced as early as uh, Last year, we actually made it a full launch recently. They were taking jobs of a, a clerk uh, standing under the cranes, physically looking at containers to check the right uh, details of the containers coming down. Now we have put cameras on the cranes and taken the job to office where the same uh, staff can now sit in the office and instead of looking at one crane, can manage three cranes at one go. So we're trying to find ways how we can uh, upscale some of the jobs that we have in the port by embarking on new technologies, automation, a lot of other things as well. Sorry. So uh, in terms of confidence, uh, as a group, we are confident to invest. Uh, for this year, we have already, uh, even, even though in midst of COVID, uh, having gone through a few other crises earlier, uh, we won't uh, discount the fact uh, rebound can come. Uh, how slow, how fast it is. So we have continued to invest this year to buy new equipments, RTGs, the rubber tired gantries, trailers, and all that. And for next year, next two years, we are also appraising as of now, whether to order five to seven new cranes to beef up the terminal capacity as well. So these are things that uh, we are doing right now. So we still have confidence, although the world is trying to move towards new things, insourcing, uh, near sourcing, a lot of other things. But in Southeast Asia, and especially in Straits of Malacca, being in the strategic location that we are, so we are pretty confident that moving forward, we still have opportunity to handle more cargoes uh, given, provided that we put the right uh, tools and investment in place to be, uh, to be able to attract these cargoes to come our way. And just to, just my last uh, part of my presentation is that moving forward, uh, we are also, like Captain Sobra updated earlier, we have already reached to the end of our uh, expansion up to container terminal, terminal 9 in our current concession. So we have already put, put forth a new plan uh, to government uh, to expand the port to double the capacity from uh, 15 million TUs close to about 28 million TUs, which is from city 10 to city 17. We've already done the technical studies. Uh, even post COVID, we are still confident we are going ahead with this we are in negotiation with government to, uh, to get the right approvals before we go ahead and do the, the foundation work for all this, which is to do the reclamation and also the dredging. Uh, our focus for now, we are hub for regional markets uh, being the second largest port in Southeast Asia. We also have acted as hub for niche small ports as well, catered for specific cargoes like Watan, uh, which is for paper products, Lubogong for palm oil products. Uh, so we're gonna focus on being the niche hub for these ports as well, on top of a bigger hub for regional markets in Southeast Asia, Indian subcon. One of the things we did pretty well in the last few years as well to attract polymer resin uh, from the Middle East and also Houston uh, to use West Ports and Port Klang as the hub for distribution, 
in Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific up to Far East. Uh, we have also been a cotton hub. We're going to continue driving the the effort to get all the specific uh, commodity cargoes to use uh, Portland as a hub. Uh, we're going to continue leveraging on PKFZ, uh, Portland Free Zone. Uh, although it's 99% uh, full, in terms of clients taking up the land, a lot of facilities are still being built. Uh, a lot of regional distribution customers have based themselves in uh, over there, like Robert Bosch, Mark and Spencer. Uh, the London Metal Exchange, actually, uh, Portland is either first or the second largest uh, hub for them in the world and also the polymers going into the free zone as well. A lot of new free zone uh, plans are in, in, in the platform, uh, looking at the success of PKFZ. The government is basically looking at option of creating another 318 acres of free zone next to the Portland free zone. And even Westport as part of our expansion, uh, the land which we have colored in green and red. Uh, future free zones we hope to uh, create in the near future because we have the confidence that uh, Portland has a niche when it comes to being a distribution hub or regional hub, owing to the fact that we have the capacity, uh, the technology, the workforce, and also the cost to be able to provide such uh, concentrated service to attract this uh, business to come to Portland. Even in Pulau Inda, uh, we have also managed to attract some big brands like IKEA and Daiso, uh, to put their facilities in place to use Portland as the regional distribution hub. So we see uh, uh, opportunity or advantage in uh, basically growing uh, our talent in this area. Although in future, uh, we are keeping it open, maybe we can become a hub for new developments or new type of uh, uh, requirement in the near future. So that's something that uh, we hope that we'll be able to attract moving, uh, moving towards the future as well, because we have the right infrastructure and also the capacity to grow either is the port capacity or the free zone capacity moving forward. So that's just something that I wanted to share from the perspective of uh, West Ports being one of the terminal operators in Port Klang and also uh, catering for the bigger part of the Malaysian import and export uh, because Port Klang today handles close to about 50% of uh, the whole of Malaysia cargo.